Good afternoon, dear colleague, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee for asking me to chair uh, this respectable session, Asian Forum Women's Heart Health and Preventing the Heart in the Adult Women. Uh, in this respectable session, there will be four uh, prominent speakers. Uh, as we know, heart disease in women is the, co uh, the leading cause of death in a developed country and maybe also in ASEAN countries. One of, out of the uh, four deaths in the United States is caused by a heart disease. Uh, I will call upon, uh, I'm uh, sorry, I'm Anna Ofarahayu from Indonesia, and I will chair this session with uh, Dr. Won Malis from uh, Cambodia. The first speaker is Dr. My Best Friend. Dr. Eleanor Lopez from uh, Philippines. She would like to talk about adult women are at risk for heart disease. Is that fact or fiction? Uh, the, she will uh, uh, deliver her talk about 20 minutes. Dr. Eleanor Lopez is a senior consultant cardiologist in the Philippine Heart Center and she is also the past president of the Philippine Heart uh, Association. Please, Dr. Eleanor, time is yours. Okay. Good afternoon. It is indeed a privilege to speak on the 25th ASEAN Federation of Cardiology Congress. I am excited to be here, though virtually, to speak on the Women's Heart Health Session. My topic will dissect heart disease in adult women and analyze whether some of our beliefs are fact or fiction. I have no conflict of interest with regards to this lecture. Allow me to be, give a brief background on the ASEAN Women's Forum. This was initiated during the 18th AFC Congress in the Philippines in December 2010. Through the initiative of Dr. Milagros Yamamoto, then chair of the Women's Heart Health Council of the Philippine Heart Association, the ASEAN Women's Alliance Toward Cardiovascular Health, or AWACH, was initiated. The presidents of the eight national heart associations or their representatives presented the status of women's health and their programs in the countries. Since then, this session has been part of the scientific program of the succeeding AFC Congresses. Now, these are my learning objectives. First, I will dissect the truth about heart disease in women. Secondly, I will discuss the risk profile of women with heart diseases. And thirdly, I will assess whether women are receiving the appropriate treatment for heart disease. Okay. Myth number one, cardiovascular disease is a man's disease. What are the facts? Based on the U.S. data, heart disease is the leading cause of death for women, killing almost 300,000 in 2017, or about one in every five female deaths. Among the Hispanics and Asian or Pacific Islander women, heart disease is second only to cancer as the cause of death. Now, who has been identified to have coronary artery disease in women? About 1 in 16 women aged 20 and older has coronary artery disease, or 6.2%. In other races, 1 in 16 white women, black women, and Hispanic women will have at least uh, CAD in 6% of cases, and about 1 in 30 Asian women, or 3.2%, have coronary artery disease. Now, cardiovascular disease, specifically coronary heart disease, is the biggest killer of women in a majority of countries, including the United States, high-income countries, and India. 
In low-income countries, coronary heart disease ranked fifth following respiratory and other infectious diseases. Now we know that in low-income countries, women's health research is focused towards maternal and child health, an area where there has been greatest public health gains have been achieved. This was also uh, the same as with cancer. Now there have been three areas where the female disadvantage in cardiovascular disease has have been identified. We have the personal or knowledge and behavior, risk factors, and professional attitudes. Let's go through each one in the succeeding slides. Now for personal knowledge and behavior, this was the result of telephone interviews in 1,600 women ages 25 or older. Less than one half knew that smoking was a risk factor. Less than one fourth named high blood pressure or cholesterol as risk factors. Less than one third identified common symptoms of heart attack. And 62% of those at high risk based on their history and risk factors rated their risk as low or moderate. And lastly, most women prefer to receive information on heart health from their doctor, but only slightly more than half report that their doctor includes discussion of prevention and lifestyle during clinical consultations. We did a local study in the Philippines in 2008. This was an interview conducted on 300 Filipino women with the goal of evaluating their attitudes, knowledge, and practices on cardiovascular disease and risk factors. Majority of the women recognize cardiovascular disease as a major risk factors, but it was only rated second to cancer as the leading cause of morbidity and mortality among the Filipino women. In the United States, the educational programs of the uh, National Lung Blood Institute, specifically the Heart Truth Program, and the American Heart Association's Go Red for Women, plus other professional scientific meetings beginning in 2004, has led to an increase in awareness of cardiovascular disease from 30% to 56% in 2009. This has led to a corresponding decline in cardiovascular disease mortality among women. However, surprisingly, in 2019, the decline in awareness of cardiovascular disease as a leading cause of death in women decreased from 56% to 44%, leading to a slow rise in cardiovascular mortality among women. The mandate here then is to create or establish culturally appropriate programs that will increase the awareness of cardiovascular disease in women and this may require a consortium of community programs to help in the project. The second uh, female disadvantage is with regards risk factors. Myth number two, risk factor for heart disease in women are different from men. What are the facts? The risk factors are similar to men except for certain sex specific risk factors. Now, this is the uh, review of the Lancet Women and Cardiovascular Disease Commission with the goal of reducing the burden by 2030. The risk factors for women have, has, have been categorized into three. We have the well-established risk factors in the middle, which includes hypertension, dyslipidemia, and diabetes. And these risk factors, though common, may present differently in women. To the left are sex-specific risk factors, namely premature menopause and pregnancy-related diseases such as diabetes and hypertension. Polycystic ovary syndrome is commonly associated with metabolic syndrome. Systemic inflammatory and autoimmune disorders are not sex-specific risk factors. However, they are more frequently associated or seen in women. To the right are under-recognized risk factors, which includes psychosocial risk factors and abuse and intimate partner violence. Now, this study reflects the relative risk factors for CHD in women versus men. The graph on the right 
is a meta-analysis, a large-scale meta-analysis of various sets of court studies from the general population. And we can see that among the risk factors, smoking, low socioeconomic status, diabetes and atrial fibrillation had a higher relative risk for women. Uh, total cholesterol was more commonly associated for CHD in men and body mass index and blood pressure did not show any sex differences. The graph on the right represents a parallel meta-analysis in a distinct set of court studies. Similar to the graph on the left, diabetes and atrial fibrillation had a higher relative effect on coronary heart disease. Smoking had a minimal and insignificant effect in women blood pressure and cholesterol did not show any sex differences, low socioeconomic status did not present with enough numbers to show any sex differences for coronary heart disease. Third myth, women present with typical profile of heart disease. What are the facts? Women present with heart attacks later than men due to the effects of estrogen. Women have atypical symptoms like indigestion, anxiety, dizziness, nausea, vomiting, neck or back pains, rather than chest pains and diaphoresis in men. Women also have higher mortality and morbidity rates from heart disease and are more likely to have a second heart attack. So in summary, women have atypical symptoms and different clinical course compared to men. Myth number four, women with ischemic heart disease have the same pathophysiology as men. The facts are women have more symptoms and physical limitations, but less obstructive coronary lesions across the syndrome of acute coronary syndrome. In addition, women present with plaque erosion. They may present with microembolization leading to endothelial dysfunction of the micro microvascular beds. Men, on the other hand, will present with plaque rupture and thrombus. When it comes to the prevalence of multivessel or left main disease, there was no gender difference uh, that was obtained in the different studies. Now let's go to the professional attitudes. Myth number five, women with heart disease are treated similarly as men. What are the facts? Women are less likely than men to obtain preventive recommendation for heart disease from their physicians. Women are less likely to have aggressive management of their risk factors. They are also less likely to receive timely intervention during a heart attack. And they are less likely to be referred for cardiac rehabilitation. In short, women with cardiovascular disease are not treated as aggressively as men. This is a review of over 10,000 patients with coronary heart disease uh, from Europe, Asia, and the Middle East. 29% of the population were women. Now, when it comes to treatment target, you can see that blood pressure in women achieved their targets. However, all other targets such as cholesterol, blood sugar, HbA1c, did not really achieve the targets among the women. In the lifestyle part of the management, a lot more women were non-smoker, but all other lifestyle, lifestyle treatment targets were not achieved in women. A sub-study of this uh, review showed that when it comes to treatment target, those who were in the, the European population showed less sex differences when it comes to treatment target. In contrast, when it comes to lifestyle target, Asian women were able to achieve the lifestyle targets that were recommended for secondary prevention of CHD. So in summary, the risk factor management for secondary prevention of coronary heart disease was generally worse in women than in men. In another review of this heart attack, heart attack patients in Florida from 1991 to 2010, they tried to look at patient-physician gender concordance 
looking at the survival rate among patients who had heart attacks. You can see from the table that female patients who were treated by male physicians had the lower survival rate compared to a female patient treated by a female physician. So they concluded that there was a higher mortality among female patients treated by male physicians. The two succeeding slides will represent the gender gaps of care for women with cardiovascular disease. When it, terms, when it comes to post stemic care, you can see that there are lower treatment rates, specifically treatment with ACE or ARB. There were lower rates of diagnostic testing and intervention procedures among patients with heart failure. There were lower rates for anticoagulation treatment in women compared to men for new atrial fibrillation. Statin treatments showed that there were lower statin prescription rates for women. And when it comes to death rates from hypertension, females had higher death rates compared to men. Now the impact of the gaps in care are as follows in terms of cardiovascular disease, it is now the number one cause of death in women and is responsible for one of four deaths. There is a greater morbidity and mortality post-stroke and MI in women because of the gap in care. In terms of ischemic heart disease in women versus men, there is a 1.5 higher mortality in women who had myocardial infarction, a 1.5 higher incidence of complications for heart failure in women. There was a two times higher morbidity and mortality among women who underwent coronary bypass surgery, and two times higher morbidity and mortality among women who suffered from angina. The last myth, myth number six, heart disease prevention differ in women compared to men. The facts are preventive measures are similar for both men and women, and these are self-explanatory. Now, a few words on hormone replacement therapy. We know that estrogen is protective in women premenopause, but the, 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 uh, the problem or the argument is, is HRT replacement therapy beneficial postmenopause? Now, in a review that compared HRT versus placebo, you can see that stroke, venous thromboli, thromboembolic events, and pulmonary embolism were higher among those given hormone replace, replacement therapy. HRT given less than 10 years postmenopause was compared to placebo. While there was a lower mortality rate and incidence of coronary heart disease, the evidence was only of moderate quality for both parameters. Venous thromboembolism remained high among those given HRT. How about HRT given 10 years post-menopause? It was shown that there was little effect on death or coronary heart disease in those patients given HRT, but stroke and venous thromboembolism remained high, and this was based on high-quality evidences. Now, this will probably guide you on whether you are planning to give HRT on your menopausal women. The recommendation is to avoid menopausal hormone therapy in patients with known ASCVD or PAD, with known venous thrombosis or pulmonary embolism, known stroke or MI, known clotting disorder or breast cancer, and those with a 10-year ASCVD risk of more than 7.5%. Now, the American Heart Association uh, presented a new guidance in the prevention of heart disease in women. Now, realizing that ad adverse pregnancy outcomes are linked to heightened cardiovascular risks, risk, they came up with this uh, statement, and the highlights are as follows. Adverse pregnancy outcomes are red flags for CVD in, in later life. Blacks, Asian, and Hispanic women are more likely than men to experience adverse pregnancy outcomes. Hence, efforts are needed to understand and ad address these disparities. Health systems are also needed to ensure that women experiencing pregnancy complications receive vigorous measures for CVD prevention. 
Uh, this was a paper written by Dr. Radural with other Asian uh, female uh, cardiologists who contributed to this study. And this recognized the barriers to education in uh, women in the Southeast Asian region. And the barriers uh, included cultural factors, psychological factors, and misconception, misconceptions, and economic and environmental factors. Among the cultural factors of note are exposure to passive smoking and the female and caretaking responsibilities. We all know that women in our region take care of our patient, of our families and put our family first before ourselves when it comes to heart diseases. The second is our, the set of psychological factors and misconception. Of note is the reluctance to attend regular health checks. There is also the belief that cardiovascular disease does not affect women. And there is a failure to recognize or denial of cardiac symptoms. And lastly, are the economic and environmental factors. And of importance is that the access to healthcare is difficult, especially in the remote areas. Many elderly women have no income and are financially dependent on their families. Now, with the observed health disparity between men and women, there is a need to increase risk factor awareness, prevention, and optical, optimal medical treatment. So the challenge is we should close the knowledge gaps, enhance awareness, target sex-specific risk factors, and engage healthcare providers and systems. In summary, Cardiovascular disease is not a man's disease. The risk factors for cardiovascular disease in women are similar to men. The pathophysiology and clinical presentation differ between sexes, but preventive measures and treatment of CVD in women must be as aggressive as men. And to end my, my lecture, let me quote, the most precious possession that ever comes to a man in this world is a woman's heart. Thank you for your attention. Sure, Eleanor, for such excellent presentation. I would like to ask Dr. Melis to introduce the second speaker and we will lead the uh, discussion at the end of this uh, speakers. Okay, Dr. Melis, could you Good introduce? Afternoon. Anna, thank you so much for handing the stage. Right now, I would like to invite Professor Niu Niu from Myanmar. She got her Master of Medical Science from, of Internal Medi Medicine, and she has her Master of Science at, uh, in Cardiology in UK. She, is, uh, she also got a doctorate in Medical Science, and right now she is the Professor and uh, Senior Consultant Cardiologist in Electrophysiology in Myanmar. I would like to invite her to have her presentation on women and on stress and women hearts. Is this an uh, individual partner? Please, the uh, Professor Yu Yu. Thank you. Greetings from Myanmar. It is my great pleasure to participate in the AFCC 2021 hosted by the Cambodia Heart Association. I am Nguyen Nguyen, Head of Cardiology Department, Yangon General Hospital, Yangon, Myanmar. I'm going to talk about the stress and the woman heart in everyday partners. These are the, my outline. What is the stress, the impact of the stress and possible pathophysiological links between the stress and cardiovascular diseases? What are the evidence between the different sex? And what are the management strategies? So what is the stress? Stress is the body reaction to the challenge or demand is the feeling of the emotional or physical tension from any event or thought. The person becomes frustrated, angry, or nervous. There are three types of stress, acute, episodic, and chronic. Stressors are situations and conditions that cause the stress. They are usually negative, like the exhausting work schedule or the rocking relationship. So these are the symptoms of the stress. Actually, the symptoms of the stress are non-specific, difficult to focus in the one system. So the impact of the stress, typically psychosocial stress is due to the difficulty in coping with the challenging environment condition. It can lead to the dysregulation of the body homeostasis. In short term, it can be positive, such as a, 
avoid the danger or meet the deadline with the long term severe or prolonged stress response responses might lead to the tissue damage and disease although the responses are adaptive. There are the three stress hormones, adrenaline, cortisol, and thyroid hormone. Adrenaline increases the heart rate, elevates the blood pressure, and boosts the energy supply. Cortisol, the primary stress hormone, increase, increases the blood glucose, enhances the glucose utilization in the brain, increases the availability of substances for the tissue repair. So the relationship between the psychosocial stressors and diseases is affected by the nature number and the persistence of the stressors, also influenced by the individual biological vulnerability, such as genetic and constitutional factors, psychosocial resources and patterns of coping. Accumulate, Long-term cumulative stress induces the activation of the sympathetic nervous system. Therefore, American Heart Association highlighted the importance of the stressful exposures and the mood disorders are predisposing factors for premature coronary heart disease in the young population. So if you look at the pathophysiological links between the psychosocial stress and cardiovascular disease, the prolonged exposure to the stressful situation causes the cardiovascular reactions like the increased blood pressure, autonomic activity and inflammation injure the endothelium and then leading to the atherosclerosis. On the other hand, people, persons with a stressful situation, having the poor health behaviors like uh, smoking, physical inactivity and alcohol consumption, difficulty to control the cardiovascular risk like the, heart, like the hypertension and blood glucose, diabetes mellitus, so also leading to the atherosclerosis. Stress decreases the person connected ability and also difficult difficulties and they found that they put difficulties in the learning new things and also have the inactive social relationship. So they are leading to the atherosclerosis, double pathogenesis. So what about the stress differences in coping the ability to the stress level? So this is a survey conducted by the American Psycho Psychological Association reported that women are more likely than men to having the high average stress levels and stress-related physical and emotional symptoms. Coronary microvascular dysfunction is common in the woman presenting with the chest pain without significant coronary obstruction. Young women show more endothelial dysfunction than men in response to their mental stress. So Lowe and group also analyzed the psychosocial factors among the women. Women may be exposed to the more psychosocial stressor than men. Stress from the relationship and family responsibility may be more important than job stress for the woman's cardiovascular health. So these are the different domains of the stress, psychosocial stress example, the relationship, finance, and what they act together, like uh, synergistically and leading to the coronary heart disease. So different domains of the stress may act synergistically to increase the risk of the coronary heart disease. Because of the more domestic and caregiving responsibility, daily routine stressor and family problems may act synergistically with the job stress, accelerating the development of the coronary heart disease in the woman. So Falcon, Reno and group, and they analyzed the stress differences in the mental stress-induced myocardial ischemia in the patient with the stable coronary heart disease. They using the MIPI scan, my myocardial perfusion scan at rest and with the mental or physical, uh, physical stress. And they measure the inducible myocardial ischemia among the women and men. They found that Incidence of the mental stress-induced myocardial ischemia was more common in the younger women, especially aged less than 50 years, and they have the threefold higher than their male counterparts and also have, was higher than older women and the men. Notably, young women had the elevated rate of the ischemia, also with the conventional stress testing, but the difference with the men was less. That this study suggested the vulnerability toward the mental stress-induced myocardial ischemia in the woman with the early onset of the coronary heart disease. 
So the same group also analyzed the sex differences in mental stress in just myocardial ischemia in the young survivor after the acute myocardial infarction. They also using the maybe perfusion scan. And compared with the, they found that compared with the age matched men, women have the age 50 or younger with associated with the higher mental stress had the, twice the rate of the mental stress induced myocardial ischemia. While the ischemia with the physical stress did not differ significantly. So you can see here, this is a diagram. The top row is that uh, row A as an uh, inducible infralateral myocardial ischemia during the mental stress. The row B and then row C is a row B is a, during the physical stress and row C is a, at rest. So row B and row C is the inducible myocardial ischemia is not much different. So also, and then you can see that the bottom one, the row C, row D, row D has a, with the, on the left, left hand side with the inducible myocardial ischemia, infralateral inducible myocardial ischemia during the mental stress. At the during the physical or physical stress, the inducible myocardial ischemia at the infralateral view is the very few in inducible myocardial ischemia. So another longitudinal study. So Women Health Initiative Observational Study is the one of the longitudinal study. So they've analyzed the association of the job strain, stressful life events, and social strain with the coronary heart, heart disease. So they found that after the adjustment of the other confounding factors, um, women with the high stressful life event schools were associated with a 12% increased risk of coronary heart disease compared with the low stressful life event school. Compared with their low social strain, high so women with the high social strain were associated with a 20% increased risk of coronary heart disease. They concluded that High stressful events and social strain were each associated with the higher coronary heart disease risk. Job strain and social strain work synergistically to increase the coronary heart disease risk. One of the collaborative meta analysis of, of the longitudinal study from the eight European countries, and they also analyzed the job strain and they found that. Uh, women with the high jaw strain experience the 46% greater risk of the coronary heart disease compared with the women with the lower jaw strain after adjusting the age. So important thing is that addressing the stress may be the key to prevent the coronary heart disease in the woman, particularly for the those who encounter the stress at work in, the, in addition to their social strain. So what are the strategies? So for the primary prevention, we need to monitor the stress as well, decreasing the workload, promoting the social network. For the secondary prevention, so we can provide the educational program and also provide the connected behavioral therapy for the patient with the person with the stressful situation. So in general, how to reduce the stress and achieve the emotional balance? Do the exercise regularly. Exercise reduces the stress, improve the mood, and boost the overall health. Build a support system and keep the positive attitude. Let go for the negative and be assertive instead of the aggressive. Find a way to relax and develop a new interest and get enough rest and sleep are important things to balance the, achieve the emotional balance. So I would like to conclude my presentation here. There is an association between the psychosocial stress and coronary heart disease in the woman. Stressful life events and social strains are associated with the increased risk of coronary heart disease among the women. Job strain and social strain interacted synergistically with the higher risk of the coronary heart disease. Addressing that stress is an important role for prevention of the coronary heart disease among the women. Thank you for your kind attention. Yes. Uh, thank you, Dr. New Yu, for the excellent presentation. Now we come to the third speaker, Dr. Yeti Sediawan. Uh, Dr. Yeti is uh, the staff of the cardiology and vascular medicine department, uh, faculty of medicine 
Universitas Indonesia and she is also an interventional cardiology administrator and Brawijaya Jaya Hospital. Uh, Dr. Yeti will talk about uh, diet fats for adult women. What is true? Which is the best? Yeah. Please, Dr. Yeti, 10 minutes is yours. Thank you so much. Can you hear my voice? Yes, clear. Okay. okay. Uh, good afternoon to professors, doctors, my fellow colleagues, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure for me to be here as a speaker in Asian Federation of Cardiology Congress, especially in women's session. My uh, talk is about diet fats for adult women, what is true and which is the best. I think it's a very interesting since uh, diet fats uh, uh, have grown in popularity uh, in recent years. Uh, I think this is due to the rise of obesity and social media use and the society's pressure uh, to be thin, especially for women. So what is the diet fats? If the diet is too good to be true, it's likely a bad diet. So uh, I think uh, it's often, it's a shame, yeah? It's often created by people with little knowledge of their long-term health uh, uh, effect. Yeah, that uh, a wet diet indeed is very trendy and very tempting, especially for a big woman. Some, uh, some fat diets, is, uh, you can see in many, many magazine or uh, studies, but in Indonesia, especially keto diets, very famous, especially for women uh, in the big city. This is the study to look the effect of ketogenic diet for 24 weeks. And the, the results is interesting. It shows that it is safe for this relatively long uh, term after administered this uh, diet. But further studies in elucidating the molecular mecha mechanism of ketogenic diet is in, still in progress. They have been shown to promote low weight and belly fat and to lower the risk of disease in overweight and obese people. Keto diet has gained huge popularity, uh, especially in women artists, also doctors. So keto diet is low carbohydrate, high fat with moderate protein consumption, and it helps in quick weight loss. There are some disadvantages, as well as it leads to increased lipid profile with regain and constipation. Some reports uh, say that the kidney will be uh, this uh, advantageous for the kidney function because of the protein uh, uh, consumption. This is the list of the health risks of fat diets published in November 2000, 2020. Okay, uh, how about the vegan, vegan diet? If you choose vegan diet, uh, you, you should uh, read this uh, study. It shows that cardiometabolic effects of high fat diet trials involving Mediterranean diet, for example, pre -gym study, have indicated that healthy monounsaturated fats are more effective in preventing cardiovascular mortality and coronary heart disease uh, compared with our low fat, low cholesterol diets, antioxidant and anti-inflammatory effects of Mediterranean diets are potential mediators of these benefits. And this is the fact that high fat diet induce insulin resistance. And if we see the fat versus carbohydrate intake in cardiometabolic risk, that multi-nutrient approach to nutrient 
nutrition science research to address the disagreement about the role of fat in causing metabolic disease. Evidence suggests that replacing dietary saturated fatty acid or PUFA reduces the risk of cardiovascular mortality. How about the fat diet? Does it work or it doesn't work? Now we choose uh, another uh, diet uh, method than the diet fats. Why? Because fat diets offer the wrong kind of weight loss. And the fat, the fat diets make dieters more susceptible to weight gain. And fat diets are impractical. And if you look at uh, some uh, studies about uh, this uh, uh, this uh, this uh, diet, fat diet, especially keto diet, and most of the women change the the method to the healthy diet and do some exercise. So uh, they start to leave this keto diet. If not a fat diet, what then? So. People now, women more eat healthy food in balance month and do some exercise. So we use the energy that we intake. So it's balanced. And our body and our lifestyle require balance, not deprivation. If you want carbohydrates, eat complex carbs that have low glycemic load, like sweet potatoes, the corn squash, the barley instead of rice. If you want sugar, eat fruits and yogurt and avoid manufactured sugar products. So don't avoid sugar. Consult the dietitian or health professional before altering your diet. This is the letter from a woman to Mr. Diet. It's true indeed. Dear Diet, it is not me, it's you. It just don't think. I just don't think it's going to work within us. You are boring, tasteless, and I can't stop cheating on you. I think it's funny, but it's true. You can see this diet cycle. Uh, it's more famous with yo-yo, yo-yo uh, uh, syndrome. Yeah. So yo-yo uh, syndrome associated with poor health outcomes, and the, the women will overreacting to uh, to eat more and more after the diet. So which is the best? This is, I think, uh, after all the fat diets, we came back to it like your mama and your coach told you, focus on balance, variety and adequacy and sport, supporting health eating. So we, we choose uh, many kinds of fruits, but uh, make it balanced with your exercise. So get moved anywhere you can. Like me, I like dancing. Before I come to the plane, I try to get moved and like just do it 10 minutes a day or uh, 150 minutes a week. Yeah, it is uh, for, uh, for your health and for your uh, stress reliever and uh, cope with your stress, of, of course. Stress is very, very uh, un, uh, convenient for women. Okay, that's my presentation. Saum Artum, terima kasih, and thank you. This is my thank picture you. in Angkor Wat. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Rieti, for your clear presentation. Dr. Melis, could you yes. introduce the next speaker, please? Thank you so much, Dr. Anna. Last but not least, we have our Dr. Go Ping Ping. She is going to present about when does physical activity become exercise for women. Dr. Go Ping Ping is a cardiologist at Mount Elizabeth Hospital. She subspecialized in echocardiography. Anyway, she completed her Bachelor of Medicine and Bachelor of Surgery at National University of Singapore in 1988. 
And she also specialized in internal medicine and further specialized in cardiology at National Heart Center, Singapore. She was the former chef of the Department of Cardiology of Changi General Hospital from 2007 to 2012. And Last, she is the adjunct assistant professor at Yong Lulin School of Medicine. She is also a member of residency accreditation committee for specialist training in cardiology. Please, Dr. Yo Ping Ping, please come and have your presentation. Thank you. Good afternoon, chairperson, fellow speakers, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for having me here today in this session for women's heart health. My talk is on physical activity and exercise, which are very important in every woman's well-being. The benefit of regular physical exercise is across the gender. Regular physical activity in the correct intensity reduces the risk of heart disease, reduces the risk of stroke, diabetes, hypertension, breast cancer, colon cancer, Alzheimer's disease, and can even decrease the risk of depression as effectively as pharmacological or behavioral therapy. We are now in the middle of a pandemic, but we must not forget that obesity and lack of physical activity have long been recognized as a global pandemic. This graph shows the increasing trend of childhood obesity through the past three decades in the US, Europe, and Asia. World Health Organization classified physical inactivity as the fourth leading cause of death after hypertension, smoking, and diabetes. And evidence of health benefit of physical activity has been available since the 1950s although efforts to promote physical activity has, sadly, been lagging behind. In fact, in the current COVID pandemic, exercise is recommended to improve immune function, particularly in those at the greatest risk for severe COVID complication, namely the older adults above age 65, those with chronic diseases, and a compromised immune system. How much physical activity is considered adequate for exercise? The American College of Sports Medicine recommends a total duration of 150 to 300 minutes per week. This can be done in bouts of at least 10 minutes each the bulk of this should be cardio or aerobic physical activity. The majority of people should do moderate intensity exercise five times a week. If they are doing high intensity exercise, then three times a week. There should also be two sessions per week of muscle strength training. These are examples of moderate intensity physical exercise. For indoors, you can put some music on and walk briskly around the house or up and down the stairs for 10 to 15 minutes, two to three times per day. Dance to your favorite music or jump rope. Do exercise video or home cardio machines. For outdoor activities, you may want to walk or jog around your neighborhood or in nature. Bicycle riding, gardening, record games, golf can all be done. Now, we also learned that sedentary behavior is an independent risk factor. Sedentary behavior is defined as any waking behavior characterized by low energy expenditure of less than 1.5 metabolic equivalents while in a sitting, reclining, or lying posture. Or screen time, which is spent on TV, video game, computer use, even car driving and reading. Studies showed that those who spend more than four hours a day on screen time versus those who spend less than two hours a day, they have 
50% higher mortality and 125% higher risk of cardiovascular disease. So we need to consider sedentary behavior and physical inactivity as separate entities to tackle. Hence, if one is homebound under quarantine or need to sit for long periods, for example, those working from home, it is necessary to increase physical activity and equally important to decrease sedentary behavior. For example, you may get up and walk around the house or do some active chore for five minutes after each hour of sitting during every commercial break uh, of watching TV. And for proper exercise, we should try to build a home-based physical activity routine. A home-based physical activity routine need the following components. Firstly, strengthening exercise such as squats, single leg balancing, push-ups, sit-ups and side planks. These can be done using your own body weight or simple equipment such as exercise bands. Secondly, conditioning activity such as jumping jacks, jogging in place, dancing to fast music, exercise videos, stationary exercise bike. Thirdly, flexibility activity, either daily stretching exercise or two to three times a week of stretching after aerobic or strength training exercises. Fourth, sport specific exercise, practicing the same skills but done indoors, uh, used in, on the running track and other sport activities. There are also many home-based exercises that are recommended by the WHO and some examples are knee to elbow, plank, side knee lift, superman, bridge, chair dips and note that these exercises can be done very simply with only the exercise mat as the equipment uh, and occasionally maybe a chair. There are also exercises that uh, concentrate more on uh, relaxation, uh, stretching and de-stressing and these include chest opener as shown here, seated meditation and legs up the wall where we can concentrate on the breathing, progressively deepen the breathing and hence uh, help in relaxation and de-stressing. There are also some advice for people returning to the gym after staying at home. Recognize that there is likely a difference from pre-COVID fitness level, so we need to have a proper expectation. Firstly, less is more. Be prepared to take one to two days break in between your exercise routine. Start slow, focus on movement quality over quantity and address any muscle or posture imbalances to avoid injury. For example, we will want to make sure that when you stand on one leg, your hip, knee and ankle should be properly aligned. Um, and uh, when you are performing plank, for example, the core needs to maintain a neutral spine. So plan ahead what type of exercises uh, or combination that you want to achieve and if necessary, seek help from fitness professionals. There's also some general advice about exercising outdoors. Avoid crowded area, safe distancing, keep at least two meters from others. Solo exercise is preferred. And if exercising with someone else, avoid making conversation. Do not travel for exercise. Try to start uh, from the front door and this is to reduce exposure to crowd. For example, in the public transport, do not take risk. Avoid 
easy roads and risky form of exercises because we do not want to overburden our healthcare system. And at risk groups should exercise indoors or in your own garden if possible. We should always limit hand to face contact and minimize the touching of common surfaces and always wash our hands thoroughly when reaching home. To conclude, these are the take home points. Physical activity is essential to improve cardiovascular health in women and boost immunity. Physical exercise benefits health even without achieving high fitness level. Quality is better than quantity. Moderate intensity physical exercise is associated with better outcome and immune function. Sedentary behavior and physical inactivity have synergistic harmful effects. And it is heartening to note that many of our regular physical exercises uh, are resuming uh, after the pandemic uh, eases. And we certainly do not want uh, to become couch potatoes. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ping Ping, for your spectacular talk. And after this, maybe we can all uh, try Dr. Ping Ping's suggestion of how to exercise. <laughs> okay, uh, now we come to the discussion. We have only four minutes, I think, uh, not much time. Uh, Dr. Eleanor, interesting. Why? Uh, women with heart disease treated uh, with acute myocardial infarction treated by women cardiologists is better than the uh, men cardiologists. <laughs> what is the reason? Uh, yes, uh, I was surprised to get when I um, saw that article, but the explanation there was that males are not really uh, trained how to handle women patients. Perhaps there's still that, uh, that, that gender sensitivity. So when it comes to, in the paper, they said that when it uh, came to female patients, they would rather select female uh, physicians to handle their case. So in the long run, the males did not get comfortable treating female patients. But remember that paper was written in the uh, 1990s up to 2000. So perhaps the culture then was such that you know male were, male physicians were more comfortable with male patients. I'm not sure now if that's still the trend, or perhaps it's not true anymore. But that's still something that we have to remember. We must perhaps in training we have yeah. to expose our uh, trainees to to all kinds of patients, regardless. Of we don't get into that uh, dilemma again, really. Yes. Uh, then I would like to ask the successful of uh, the Philippines, Myanmar, Singapore, and Indonesia in uh, raising the awareness of cardiovascular disease in women in their country. Uh, how, how are the successful of this program? Uh, in, in the Philippines, our council, despite the pandemic, has been very active in, in, in uh, conducting webinars. And we have been, the council has been targeting specifically big women groups. Uh, we went uh, to talk to the Girl Scouts of the Philippines. Then the group talked to uh, the Philippine Dermatological Society. So we're going, uh, tapping our colleagues in the other specialties. Uh, recently, uh, they they went. Uh, they had a webinar with the Philippine Obstetrics and Gynecological Society. So, I think the plus side of the pandemic is that you can conduct more uh, teaching webinars, tapping all other interested groups. And like before, when we were doing face to face, it was very difficult to gather so many participants. But nowadays, because of the webinars. We were able to tap very interested uh, groups, no? not only women groups. I'm sure there were males in the group. For example, in the 
Philippine Obstetric Gynecological Society, there were male uh, ob obstetricians who were in participants uh, in, that, in that webinar. So we're still doing our uh, educational program. Oh, maybe uh, Dr. Pimpi? Oh, but in, uh, in uh, Singapore, oh, in Myanmar, maybe Dr. Nyo Nyo? Uh, we do not have the many activities during the pandemic, but the women heart health is uh, led by the Myanmar Women Association. And then this association is together with the Women and Children Association. So we do the some educational talk, and then we also do the, for the some webinar for the training. But we do not have much activities during the pandemic. Previously, we have the many activities. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. But uh, it is always interesting to talk about women's heart health. But I'm very sorry that uh, the time is up. <laughs> and I would like to thank the, uh, all the speakers and participants. And I'm sure that the, uh, the stressful in this pandemic uh, COVID era uh, will also influence women's heart. So we have to prepare uh, to, to, to have uh, women with a heart disease in the next decade. Okay, thank you very much for all the speakers. And uh, so we hope to see you all again in the next uh, meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you all. Goodbye. Goodbye. Goodbye.